online education has certainly gone mainstream. Developers and companies have finally gotten comfortable taking online courses. Sometimes these are recorded, self-paced courses like the ones we have at TalkPython Training. Other times, they're more like live events in webcast format. In this episode, you'll meet two guys who are taking the interactivity of online learning up a notch. Brian Clark and Cecil Phillip run a weekly event on Twitch where they're live streaming an interactive Python course. They take questions from hundreds of students and dig into the diversions that mainstream online learning simply cannot. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 242, recorded on location at Microsoft Ignite in Orlando, Florida, November 7th, 2019. Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. Brian Cecil, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I'm super excited to talk about this Twitch stuff. Like To me, Twitch and Mixer and all these cool live stream gaming things. They're, they're amazing. And it's just such a different world that I, I'm used to. But it's, it hasn't been on my radar as a programming thing until Cecil, you said, hey, you know what we're doing together? And I'm like, no way, that is, that is really cool. So we're going to talk about your live stream, your live streaming Python education and developer education in general. Yeah. But before we get there, let's just talk a little bit about, about you and get people the background on you. You haven't been on the show yet, Brian. So how'd you get into programming Python real quickly? Well, programming Python in particular I'm normally programming in JavaScript. Prior okay. to that, it was C Sharp and .NET. And I just like challenging myself to learn new, new languages. Also, Cecil and I are on the cloud advocacy team. And in particular, our audience is around academic. And you've got to learn a bunch of languages for that. They're like, we work with Scala. You're like, what is Scala? I, I got to go figure this out, apparently, right? right? Yeah, okay. Exactly. And the part of what we were wanting to do is kind of, at least what I started out with, and I've, I've since learned that Cecil had a little bit of background in Python prior to starting the show. But we really wanted to take a beginner-centric approach to it, like straight up, what's a variable, what's constant, what's, you know, that kind of stuff. I think that's so interesting because yeah, we'll get more into this, but you really do have that beginner focus. So you don't have to be like on your fifth year of doing this language to make it worthwhile, right? Exactly. Yeah. That kind of sparked the idea to, all right, I've been interested in Python. There's a lot of machine learning and AI that's around it that I want to get into more. Let me learn Python and start with that. And so that's how that kind of came to be. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. And Cecil, maybe tell people just quickly about yourself. You've been on the show before doing all sorts of cool stuff. You were on the evangelist, the dev evangelist advocacy story, the panel. That was really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were on before and we talked a little bit about developer evangelism and advocacy and, and what that is. Well, kind of like what Brian said, right? I'm, I'm on the uh, CA team or the cloud advocate team. Uh -huh. And essentially, you know, the team that me and Brian are on, we talk a lot with students, with faculty members. I really just try to understand, like, what are some of their needs from an educational perspective? When it comes to Microsoft products, when it comes to cloud technology or Visual Studio Code or, you know, machine learning and IoT and like some of these, you know, really interesting topics. Yeah. Well, how, what does that mean for a student? And what does that mean for you trying to establish like your career path going forward? Yeah. And traditionally that's meant, okay, we're using Windows, maybe Windows Server. We're using C Sharp or possibly C++ if you want to kind of spread out. It didn't used to mean Linux and Python, did it? <laughs> All right, it's a different world where you're living now. It's a totally different world. And, but I think, too, what, I, what I'm realizing is the more schools that you talk to, all of them have like a different origin story, right? Like all of them have a very different background. The college that I went to, I went to Florida Tech I'm in Melbourne, Florida, which is not too far from where we are today. Yeah. And it was, everybody had a Windows machine, right? That was, that was <laughs> normal. And this is a while ago, right? This is when people still had like compact presarios for like their laptops. And Did you connect to the internet silently or with noise? At home, <laughs> when I went to my house, when I went home, we definitely had like a 56K modem that, you know, did the ringing, ringing thing. I remember being able to distinguish the noise. You would hear, you're like, oh, I got 38, whatever, or I got 56K. You could tell the connection noise. You're like, oh, that's a good one. We're going to do some downloading today. That's funny. <laughs> that's funny. But yeah, um, just depending on the types of schools that you go to, like where they are and what their focus is, mm. you'll see a lot of different types of technologies and, and things of that nature. Some of them are very Linux friendly. You know what I mean? Some of them are very Windows friendly. Surprisingly, 
over the schools that I've personally visited, I haven't seen a lot of Macintosh machines, which is interesting. It is interesting. Uh, you know, Macintosh are kind of obscenely expensive. And that is true. Right. And that's why I figured it was, right? Yeah. Like, and as a student, right, I think of my daughters who are both in college now, they're paying their own rent. We cover their tuition, but they got to pay their rent. And things like, do I need a new phone this year, even though it's broken? It's like, I don't know if I can afford that 600 bucks. Yeah. And right. And like this MacBook, I love it, but it was over three grand. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. But in the developer world, like this is the environment that we're used to. Yes, right? yeah, because like, we have well-paying jobs, generally speaking, so it's not that big of a deal, right? Sure, sure. I mean, whether it's the case that we have the financial means to do it ourselves or we have company-sponsored machines or something like that. Yeah, yeah, your companies will just say, here's your machine. Yeah, for sure. But it just shows you that there's a different perspective now that when you go to schools, like the resources that we have is not the same. So you're seeing more Windows machines there maybe huh definitely more windows machines how about linux through chromebooks randomly every now and again okay a few folks using ubuntu and you know maybe gentoo or something like that from from a linux perspective cool well before we get into the topics you know i don't know if the final show will have the background noise it may certainly there's a lot of background noise for us right here because we're recording on location at microsoft ignite yeah and it's it's such a crazy conference i thought of microsoft build as a one of the really large conferences PyCon, you know, we get like 3,500 people attend there. This is like 10x PyCon, right? I had no idea how big it was. Somewhere around, around 30,000 attendees, something like that. It's something, man. So I'm, there's a lot of stuff going on, and it's, it's a little interesting to be here as a, a Python person because there is some interesting Python stuff. I just watched Steve Dower's presentation about Python security. Nice, okay. That, that was really cool. But there's also a lot of stuff that is, is like kind of foreign to me. There's some, some interesting companies, but maybe tell us a little bit about like some of the announcements. Like we have, um, you know, Azure on-prem is pretty interesting. And we have VS Code, uh, yeah, VS Code online. Like, so there's a few relevant things maybe to point out from what's happening this week. That's the one that's the VS Code online one is the one I'm most excited about and was like really pumped to try out and just start tinkering with. In fact, to the point where it was, I used it as a backup for my talk where I was uh, demonstrating some an extension in Visual Studio Code. Oh, really? It's in preview, the extension, and sometimes I'm still learning Python and setting up my environment properly, and I think I have something misconfigured on my laptop. And so if I had it as a backup, because that environment, I could spin it up. It's using Linux behind the scenes, and I was able to get the extension working with all the Python dependencies that I needed, and it went smoothly, thankfully. Yeah, I think this is going to be really empowering for developers, right? It's like... You go here, you click the button, like Cecil was telling us yesterday, like you can have a thing on your GitHub repository, like launch this in VS Code online, basically. The other aspect of it that's going to be super interesting to see people use it for it, speaking of academic and just teaching and learning and that kind of stuff, is in workshops or in classrooms, being able to set up a predetermined environment that already automatically loads up the code that you might need or the demo application right from GitHub yeah. so that your students or just the attendees in there have their environment already set to go. You're not wasting time in the beginning, making sure everybody's on the same page. You're also dealing with a lot of people that'll get like work issued devices like you, you both were just talking about and they have limited rights to install stuff. Right, I don't have permissions or I have a Chromebook and it won't run it or whatever, right? Exactly, so doing yeah. it all from the browser like that makes it super interesting to open up the doors that way. Yeah, Cecil, do you see this as something you could tie into your live stream? Definitely, I think maybe at some point in time, and I mean, Brian and I haven't spoken about it yet, but. Maybe we could find a way to kind of integrate it into the stream, maybe do a quick demo of it, you know, really just to show folks what's possible. Because kind of like what you were saying before, I think the benefit there is just to be able to get going quickly. Like there's pretty much little to no setup, right? Like I don't have to worry about installing operating system updates and having the right dependencies and those types of things happen. Yeah. I'm assuming there might be a way to like set up a blueprint or a template so that now we have multiple people that are trying to create the same environment from the same repo. Yeah. And so now we all just have like the same environment set up, essentially. Our own instance of the same environment. Yeah, it seems like a great way to help people who are just getting going, right? Like they're coming to the stream to learn what the heck Python is and how it works, right? So it, it's perfect. Like click this button and we'll get you rolling. Yeah, definitely. I think two, was it two days ago? Two days from the day of us recording anyway. <laughs> so again, like Brian and I have the stream and usually what we do is we take some of the code that we write on stream I will push it into a GitHub repo. And so after I saw the announcement, I was like, oh, well, let me go and see if I can get our code from the repo running in VS Online. Yeah, yeah. And it was super simple. There was literally like two or three buttons I had to press, right? Like, you know, create environment. I had <laughs> to put in what repo I wanted it to, to come from. And, and that was it, right? And then now, like, I have a machine set up. There's Visual Studio Code running inside of the browser. It already had Python on it installed, so I didn't have to install it, which was super cool. Yeah, 3.8, right? Like, 
shiny new Python. Yeah, it's Python 3.8, which yeah, as, that's, of, that's as of today, I think is, is maybe like three weeks yeah, old, yeah, maybe weeks, not even yeah, a maybe, month old yeah, yet. Yeah. So, so that was really cool to see that, you know, how easy that was to set up. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a, a cool announcement coming out of here. And I'm sure a lot of people can make use of it, especially in education where setup is, is challenging. Right. Like Jupyter Notebooks are nice and I do like them, but I would prefer to learn with something that has auto complete that's a little bit better. And like, I just like the tooling of like a more of a dev editor more than I do like Jupyter, even though Jupyter Labs is pretty killer. All right. So let's talk about Twitch. And uh, Brian, I guess that started with you, right? You've been doing Twitch for a while. I'm so happy to be able to talk about it because I'm super passionate about just live streaming in general. And That's awesome. So tell everyone what Twitch is out there. I, I know a lot of folks know, but a lot of people are like, you know, Twitch is like a thing that a person does, not necessarily a... A, a, a platform. It's traditionally thought of as like everybody goes there to watch other people play video games. Right. And these are like sort of the, the famous YouTube influencer types, but of the gamer world. They'll go there and they'll play, I don't know, Warcraft or Fortnite or something for 12 hours straight. And people are such fans, they'll just watch that, right? Yeah. People in our industry might think, well, you're just going there to goof off. But the surprise is there's a lot of other types of content that's available on the platform that people are yeah. streaming about between not just programming, but there's people that are building stuff hardware wise. There's people that are doing arts and crafts, creative related type of things, drawing, painting. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff on the platform that you can watch and be entertained by and learn. That's super cool. I think it's similar to YouTube in that sense. Like YouTube sounds like a, to a lot of people, oh, they were on YouTube all day. They did nothing, right? It could have been you were watching like an awesome, like build this app like the one you need to build in Django on YouTube, right? That could be like super productive YouTube. Yeah, and I think the, the key difference though there with this and, that, and what draws me to live streaming is that the, way, the ability as a viewer to engage with the person that might be teaching something or doing something like that. I put a bunch of stuff on YouTube and then I might get comments about it. Right. Some of them are super negative, some are unrelated, some are positive, but like it's like that's the YouTube world, but like it's not real time. Like I create it and then I publish it and I go to bed and then I get a notification. Yep. It seems to me watching you two on your channel that it's very interactive. Absolutely. Yeah. So with YouTube and that stuff, it's all scripted out. And most of the time, I mean, there are, I'm not to say there aren't people that don't do this, but you're going to see just the happy path, right? How do you get from A to B building this whole app out? Right. 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 The mistake I made, I edited that out because it would look stupid. Exactly. You don't want to look like you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's what kind of is intimidating as a streamer though. And to get into it is yeah. you're doing it live in front of potentially you know several people and you're going to be making mistakes but that's the benefit of going there and being there in the moment you get to see like what it is real life you're not getting the pretty picture all the time right up front that's super positive i mean i do think this is a really valuable skill that people can develop because when you're doing like recorded stuff yeah you learn a lot and that that's great but when you're doing the live presentation, you have to think about what you're saying. You've got to engage with the people. You've got to type and talk. It's much like in-person training, but just separated physically, right? Like, I think it really gives you a skill of just like presenting in general around code that people are like, how did you just go up there and you typed and you talked and you were looking at that other person? It's well, it's because I've done like hundreds of hours, right? Like I did an in-person world. You guys do it on online, right? Yeah, it's definitely something where when I first started out, like I still have the recordings of my very first streams. Are they hard to watch? Well, it's, even the most recent one is hard to watch. I can't stand <laughs> here myself. I'm not going to be able to listen to this podcast either. You know, like it's just the way it is. Yeah. It's very rough. You could tell that I'm not used to being able to multitask like that. And now I feel like it just, you know, it comes as second nature. But you seem super smooth, like both of you guys do. Cecil, what do you think about this idea of like using live streaming as a way to like almost become better at presenting in general? I think it's definitely a great opportunity for, for particularly folks that are new because I think it makes it a lot less intimidating. Yeah. Because essentially I'm looking at my room, right, or my camera or my computer or, you know, my office setup and I'm not looking at a room with <laughs> 10 people or 20 people or 100 people or whatever the case is. You're not getting those blank stares back that kill you, yeah? Right, right, right. right. So I think from that perspective, it gives you a great opportunity to practice. It gives you a great opportunity to even just deliver content to a group of folks in just in a very natural way, right? Because I could just imagine you being a lot more nervous when there's a stage and there's a camera and there's lights and, yeah. you know, there's sound and, you know, there's kind of like we're in a room right now and there's a lot of background <laughs> noise going on, right? Like there's a lot of emotion that kind of goes into that. And when you think about like how your emotions like, you know, affect your body and affect like 
the tone of your voice and the shakiness of your hands. They can just get you distracted, right? They can break your thought patterns. And like, I knew I was going to do thing, this thing in the presentation. Now I'm so freaked out that person's looking at me. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, right? Yeah, it's tough. Exactly. So I think it's a great opportunity for folks to do that. Even just me and Brian are, are learning and, and getting better at becoming like Python folks, right? Yeah. And engaging in the community and really just understanding, you know, what's possible right, and what we can do. This portion of Talk Python to Me is brought to you by Linode. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing your enterprise's infrastructure, Linode has the pricing, support, and scale that you need to take your project to the next level. With 11 data centers worldwide, including their newest data center in Sydney, Australia, enterprise-grade hardware, S3-compatible storage, and the next-generation network, Linode delivers the performance that you expect at a price that you don't. Get started on Linode today with a $20 credit and you get access to native SSD storage, a 40 gigabit network, industry-leading processors, their revamped cloud manager at cloud.linode.com, root access to your server, along with their newest API and a Python CLI. Just visit talkpython.fm slash Linode when creating a new Linode account and you'll automatically get $20 credit for your next project. Oh, and one last thing, they're hiring. Go to linode.com slash careers to find out more. Let him know that we sent you. Brian, maybe tell me what was the first stuff that you started streaming on the channel? And like, you don't do just Python, right? I thought I saw some JavaScript stuff on one of your streams as well. Is that right? Yeah, I'm up to three shows now, actually. Okay. So I originally was just doing JavaScript related stuff where I was building out a bot that interacts to makes it more engaging for the viewers. It's built into the chat room there. Okay. Which lets them do commands and all that kind of fun stuff. That's an ever growing and, and iterating on that. Is project. that like the, the bang mark and that type of stuff? Yes, absolutely. That you built that and plugged that in, that bot in? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, thought, I just thought that was a Twitch thing. That's cool. No, no, no. Yeah, it's, it's kind right, of... tell people about how that works. So... Just real quick. Yeah, really quick. It, basically, it's just listening through the Twitch API through the chat room. If you send certain keywords in there, prefix with an exclamation point, and it knows that that recognizes that's a command, it can do other things. So the first thing we ever built out was a light bulb in my office. People can change the color of that through a command in the chat room. So it's kind of interesting for a viewer to come in and be like, oh, wow. Was that just like a novelty or did they use it as like productive? Like if they change it to red, that means slow down. If they change it to green, it means speed up or anything like that? I think a little bit of both, honestly. Okay. So some people it's like, wow, that's cool. I'm changing somebody's light bulb color across <laughs> the globe from wherever I'm in, in the world. Yeah, yeah. But also it's been helpful at times. Like if I get so like focused in on that flow state where I'm working on something, people can grab my attention and be like, hey, you actually missed this or something like that by changing the color of the light. Or if somebody does something nice like follows or subscribes to the channel, it alerts me that way, that kind of thing. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. I didn't start out doing that, actually. When I first started streaming, I didn't know what to stream yet. Uh, I just knew that like JavaScript was my main language of choice to use. And so I just started going to, uh, have you heard of Code Wars? No, I've heard of Code Combat, but not Code Wars. Very similar concept. It's just like little coding challenges and stuff like that. And so I was like, Typical. on the weekend nights, I was like, let me try for an hour and get my feet wet doing this. Mm -hmm. And then it led into what we have today, where we have three shows. We have the Learning Python from Scratch with Cecil. Just started up a Build Up Devs show, which is more about the like social side, the human side of being developers in the industry. Yeah, that's cool. That sounds really interesting. And then my Friday streams are just me being crazy, wacky, working on the chat bot and just being a goofball. Cool. So Cecil, maybe talk a little bit about what you guys cover on there. So you're going through Nina Zakarenko's course, which is a free Python course, friend of the show. Hi, Nina. And uh, that's a, a two-day course that you guys have been going on for a while, right? Our teammate Nina Zakarenko, so she's also a cloud advocate um, at Microsoft with us. And she has a free course. It's at learnpython.dev. Totally free. It's actually a GitHub repo. And you know you could generate GitHub pages from a repo, right? So yeah. Essentially, it's a GitHub repo that you know, she generated and turned into like an online workshop. And now with this workshop, there's two days. And essentially, it goes from very beginner Python concepts. And right now, we just finished our first day, maybe like two weeks ago or something like that. But it's taken us four months to do, which I think is, is kind of interesting. It's super interesting, right? Because... I mean, it's self-paced learning, and so it's kind of like a whole day of maybe in-person, right? Would you say it's like a, in, a one day in-person? So, so if you were, say, to do that self-paced, maybe you do it a couple hours a day, like a week, maybe yeah. a week to do a day, like if you're doing part-time, but you took four months. I mean, I know you don't do every day, right? But still, right, right. that's interesting, and I think it, it touches a little bit on giving people the sense of like the true interactive nature of what you guys got going on, right? Yeah, totally. When we first started this, I was like, oh, okay, we'll knock this out in two months, and that'll be it, and then we'll, we'll do another thing, right? But um, it turns out that every section that we do, because we pay so much attention to what's happening in the Twitch chat room, and as um, members that are watching kind of pop in and pop out, 
we get a lot of questions. We get a lot of suggestions. We get a lot of ideas about, hey, why don't you try this out and let's see what happens? Or, hey, I didn't. Could you re-explain this particular topic? Or did you know that there was this other language feature that wasn't necessarily covered in the that section? But you know, let's just try it on the seat. Here's list comprehensions, but you can also do it with dictionaries. And I didn't talk about that, but but here we can we can do it here as well, right? It's kind of the same idea, yeah. Right. So just from that, like that's how you know streaming once a week for three hours on a Wednesday <laughs> turns into like four months of a video, which should have been like a one day section, right? But just because like, we just we've just been so thorough and just been answering tons of questions, and you know like all the interactions that Brian has built into the stream from. You're turning his light bulbs on, and then there's little sounds that folks can play. Brian, you've got like funny Wednesday sounds and stuff. Like, yeah, like it's it's very like appropriate to Twitch, right? It feels like it's very very much part of that community that those styles that you got there. Right, and that's one of the things that I think differentiates it from a webinar or live streaming on YouTube or just putting out a YouTube video because YouTube has live chat, sure, and you know you could do live streaming there. But I think having the ability to customize that experience for the folks that are watching makes a huge difference. And it makes them feel like they're a part of that video that we just produced. I did really get that sense that people feel part of it, that you guys welcome them when they come, that, that there's this deep exploration that they're a part of. And it does, you know, just to talk to the audience for a moment, like it's really quite early days in, in terms of where you're starting, right? Like you, you explain what virtual environments are and you said you started explaining like what a variable was. And there's a lot of folks where there's not that level of training available, right? Like none of my courses assume you don't know what a string is necessarily. You know, I mean, it doesn't assume much, but there's like this sort of thinking like a programmer thing you, you got to do. And I feel like you guys are doing a good job helping. I think one of the good things with what me and Brian end, end up having to do is because he has experience in JavaScript, I have most of my professional experience in, in .NET and C Sharp. We're able to give the perspective of, hey, we know a little bit about programming from other languages and frameworks and things of that nature. How can we apply that to Python and use that knowledge to make us good teachers? Right? Yeah. So even though we're not Python, even though we're not Python experts, and even though you know we don't get paid to do Python, we don't have Python things in production, we don't have open source packages that folks are using, we do understand like some of the basic constructs of programming. And so we could use that background knowledge that we have to apply this to learning like this new environment. Brian, what was your experience in Python when you came into doing this channel here? Like how much? The extent was I could just recognize it when I would see it. I've like reviewed Python code kind of thing. Yeah. But that was the extent of my experience. Okay. I feel like this is actually, it can be an advantage, right? It can be, I'm at, I'm at a similar level as the people learning what I'm doing. So if they follow along with me, I'm not like, well... I don't know what was wrong. Why can't you create a virtual environment and install this? Like, obviously, that's an easy step. Let's get past that to the real, right? Like, you're you're going through these steps with them. Yeah, I think that's powerful, right? Yeah. What do you think? Do people react positively to that? Yeah, and so far it's been we've gotten a lot of positive feedback because people will even go back to the past recordings because we post stream notes and video recordings on YouTube, and you can catch them on Twitch. But Twitch will only do it for a certain length of time they'll stay on there yeah and people will come in and they'll be like hey i've been catching up where i'm almost up to your current episode but thank you so much this has been super helpful because i'm a beginner as well and it's been a fun challenge for me both from the aspect of like i don't i didn't know python prior to this but also to challenge myself to get back to the roots because you know i think we get so engulfed in we've already learned that lower level stuff that you yeah. maybe you got in in college or whatever education background you might have i just want to talk about the new features of angular 2 or whatever right exactly yeah, right okay. we get all hyped up about the new stuff and what we've already learned and, and take for granted that kind of thing so it's been a fun challenge to get back to that and be like how do i explain a var what a variable is to somebody or how do i explain what a function is you know and it's been really interesting from that perspective, right? Yeah, you talked about the videos being available on YouTube. And until I was talking to Cecil last night, I didn't really realize that. I went, I just went to the Twitch channel and there's like a video section. I'm like, oh, these must be the videos that I get to look from yeah. over in the past. But there's a whole separate YouTube story around like your channel and stuff people can check out. Yes, absolutely. So because what we're trying to do is make it so that it's not just like a one shot and then it's gone kind of thing, right? It's right, like, which is great. We want to be able to, for my own benefit too, go back and reference like how did we set up those virtual environments that first time, right? Yeah. And so the one way we found to do that, well, it's twofold what we're doing. Exporting to YouTube, you can do that directly from Twitch. Twitch gives you that ability. And then uh, creating like a blog post stream note kind of thing that we've been posting on a website called Dev2, okay. which is like a very developer-centric blogging thing. So it's kind of like we went from medium.com to do a lot of our 
tech blogging and now Dev2 is like a more comfortable environment for specific to us. Yeah, what do you think about the Medium story these days? I've never really been too deep into blogging, so I, I don't know that I have a strong opinion one way or the other. I am really enjoying writing and posting on Dev2 nowadays because it's just Markdown. I mean, not to say that you couldn't really do that in Medium, I think, but... Yeah, there's just all that drama around Medium going paid. Yes. Putting up the paywall in a lot of places. And I think that struck a lot of people as a little bit a little yes. bit off. From that perspective, as somebody that's a casual Medium, I'll go there, like people will link to it. I get frustrated when I get... I open up a website, whether it's on my phone or on a desktop, and I'm immediately presented with some type of notification, right? A platform that's supposed to be allow people to read, maybe if I'm midway through it, hit me up with something like that. But like immediately, that's where it's like a huge turnoff for me. But that's with any site, not let alone Medium. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Cecil, so what do you think about Medium? Are you a fan? Did you see that as frustrating when they put that when they went pay paywall? Yeah, I saw that. I saw that, and um, I guess similar to Brian, like it didn't really affect me as much because I'm not a big writer. I do a lot of video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. It's, I'm very it's, comfortable it's, in like <laughs> doing video and those types of things. Yeah, whether it's for Channel Nine or like live stream that me and Brian are doing, I totally get it, and I understand why people would want to have a certain level of trust and a certain level of integrity when it comes to like their written content. The first several years where it was taking off, people felt that I'm writing on this platform that's open for everyone. And then it became not open somewhat, which I, I feel like a lot of those people wouldn't have gone there in the first place had they known that was the destination, you know? Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the reasons why we do appreciate Dev2 is it's built on open source technology. The, the code for it is all actually open source. You could go and look at it. You could contribute to it. It's open from the ground up, right? Which is, which is a great thing. Yeah, that, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so people can find the stuff on YouTube. That's cool. And we'll put that link in the show notes and they can go back and check it out. Brian, does it cost anything to be as a participant to like join, to watch your channel or anything like that? Like how, how does it work? No, everything is absolutely free. Okay. You just pop in, start tuning in. You can listen to it passively. You can stay, you know, really focused. Do you have to subscribe to get notified to get in or can I just like... Is it just like go to like a YouTube video that's open or how's it work? Really, you just show up to the channel and you're able to catch everything. There's there are options to subscribe. I mean, so if you want to get notified when things go live, uh, you Twitch has a feature where you follow and then you can turn on notifications for when somebody goes live. Right, like create a free Twitch account and then you can subscribe and get an email or something like that. Absolutely, yeah, okay. yeah. You create a free account, doesn't cost anything to create an account, and then you can just start watching things. The way Twitch will maybe un, you know get you to make some money is you'll see ads when you go to people's channels that way. I see. Okay. Yeah. A little bit like YouTube in that regard. Yep. Okay. And as uh, somebody else out there wants to do something like this, what's the story there? Like, do they have to be like a pro Twitch person or like, how does that work? No, I mean, it's very beginner. Well, it's not beginner friendly necessarily. It can be intimidating as somebody starting out wanting to start streaming on the platform or any platform in general. Yeah. But the general advice that I give people that are beginning is to pick a, a dedicated time once a week that you can consistently stick to so that you, you can actually get a feel for what it's like to be streaming and uh, so that you don't necessarily um, you know, lose sight of being able to continue to do it. Like What ends, tends to happen is people think that they might want to start streaming and then they'll do one or two here and there and then they, will, you know, they won't find the time to do it. It's kind of like having a TV show, right? People come to expect to see you at a certain time and date. And uh, if you're not there, then you lose that traction that you might get. Yeah, probably even more so than blogging or even podcasting because it's the inter live interactive is the bit that's interesting. So you've got to have it on a predictable time frame, right? Yes, for sure. And then the other bit of advice I'd say in terms of like actually setting it up technology wise, I mean, I could go into detail about what I use, but really I just say, keep it basic. Just have a camera and share your desk, a uh, desktop and you're good to go. You know, have whatever microphone, start simple and then build upon that as you start realizing that you're really into doing this you you enjoy it right yeah i've seen some super elaborate setups that various people have especially in the gaming world yep you know like racing simulators and all sorts of weird and crazy awesome looking setup but yeah so you can get started pretty easy huh and i don't know i mean the mics that we're sitting here talking on they probably sound pretty good i guess the, the normal podcast mics and these are like 70 dollars. and i guess you probably wouldn't need much more than that plug it in the usb and you're good to go. For sure. You could definitely go that route. But I mean, use what you have to get started, to get a feel, to make sure that you really are interested and dedicated to continuing doing it before you make that investment, right? I think what ends up happening is people 
there's all kinds of options and things and hardware. You can geek out over it like crazy, right? Sure. Just like with that, like I'm sure as you start getting into podcasts and you, you started off on certain types of <laughs> hardware and then you dig deeper and you, you get into this elaborate setup that you got now. I spent a ridiculous amount of money on microphones to end up back on like the cheapest option. Oh, really? I spent over $1,000 on microphones. Oh my gosh. And these, like I said, are 70 bucks and I like them better than all those others. It's just like, <laughs> you just got to search, right? But it would be ridiculous to do that at the beginning. But if I do this like two shows a week, every week for four years, it makes sense to like start to go and see what works, right? Right, exactly. And I think people will get intimidated and it basically they, they stop themselves before they even get started because they're worried about what they're going to use setup wise. And you'd be surprised that the viewers actually, they'll know that you're a beginner streamer, but that will make them feel even more involved with it because they're like, they're there, they're first, right? They're the first post on the... On the they want to support you. Right. And so that makes it interesting. And then they'll see you evolve over time and add to it and support you that way. And uh, that's what the culture is all about there. It sounds pretty welcoming, really. Yes, it absolutely is. I mean, I've had, I've for the most part had a very positive and pleasant experience with the developer community on Twitch. That's not to say there isn't some negativity and the, and the usual trolling kind of that goes on that it, happens it every now and online. then. It is online. Yeah, it is. We're on the <laughs> internet, folks, right? So, but for the most part, you'll, you'll see it's very, very kind atmosphere on the platform there. That sounds really cool. It seems like it might be a good idea to like have a, a content calendar for in the early days, like before you do your first stream, like plan out what are the next, what does the next month look like? Because I can really, I can see it'd be so easy to get really into it, excited, do the one or two things you had on your mind and then go, I don't really know what to do now. Like, do you guys, pl you have a pretty long-term plan, I guess. That's what with like the course, for example. I mean, I guess it's a long-term plan. <laughs> you had no idea. <laughs> Again, when we first started this, it was <laughs> Nina's course, um, learnpython.dev. It's two days and we're at month four, four plus now. And we're just in day one. <laughs> I'm going to assume that we got at least another four months. Sounds like a long-term plan. You guys got. <laughs> but uh, we have spoken a little bit about... What are some other things that we'd like to do just in terms of topics? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Like, what else are you thinking? So, well, first of all, a lot of this, too, has also come from the chat room, right? The chat room on Twitch, because we have a wide range of experience levels there, from people that are brand new and I've never seen, like, code before to folks that write Python for a living. And, you know, again, just engaging with folks in the chat room and, you know, in the live stream, they suggest topics like, hey, can we talk about this? We did one last week on pipenv and um, right, right. on pyenv. And that was because some, some folks in the chat room, they kept asking about it. So we're like, well, let's, let's just do it, right? Like, and now it seems like a good time to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you keep saying pip3 right. dash, or, or Python dash MVMV, right? Or something, something like that. And they're like, well, I've heard there's other things, right? So you could just make that the topic of the day. Yeah, and what becomes important there now, too, is because we want to remain beginner-friendly, it's important that we have a certain amount of like, foundational content there first. Right. Because when, when the first, well, I think the first time somebody suggested it, I was like, you know, that seems like a little bit ahead of like where we want to be right now. Yeah. 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 It seems a little bit intimidating. It's, it was intimidating for me. How about we start with like some machine learning car? Like, could we do self driving cars and put it on like an RC car? Like, let's start there. Right. Like, yeah. no, maybe not. <laughs> Folks have asked about Docker, they've asked about machine learning, about web stuff. But again, like, we're in day one, right? <laughs> Four months later, we're in day one. But we're just trying to make sure that cover our bases and make sure that everybody understands what is a function and understands what's conditional logic and then yeah what is an environment and what is pip and what is a package and like where does this code come from like does it just come from outer space and now i just use it like <laughs> you know like what do those things look like because i think unless you have that foundational information you're not going to understand the benefit of using this tool yeah and so it's answering the question for like that one person like let's answer it for everybody and just make sure that we're all in the same foundation i find it very powerful to say it's one thing to write down, here's what you do to do a thing. It's, oh, it's entirely another to see, like, here was a blank screen and nothing complicated happened. And then now here's something awesome created, right? Like, I think just seeing that built up is a really powerful experience. And it seems like that's like a good part of the channel. Like you have screen sharing, you got the editor open using VS Code a lot of times, right? And you're just over there working on that. That's really great for beginners. There's a lot of opportunity on both sides of the table. I've definitely learned a lot. I'm sure Brian will say the same thing. He's definitely learned a lot. It's definitely affected even our jobs, to be honest with you. This portion of Talk Python to Me is brought to you by the University of San Francisco. Learn how to use Python to analyze the digital economy in the new Masters in Applied Economics at the University of San Francisco. Located at the epicenter of digital disruption, USF is the ideal launching pad for the next phase of your career. Their new STEM-designated economics program doesn't just provide technical training in high-demand skills like machine learning, causal inference, 
experimental design, and econometrics, it takes the next step, teaching you how to apply these techniques to understand the economics of platforms, auctions, pricing, and competitive business strategy in the world of big data. The program is open to beginner and to advanced coders looking to apply their skills in a new area. Applications are now open for the fall 2020 classes. To learn more and get an application fee waiver, go to talkpython.fm slash USF. That's talkpython.fm slash USF. Tell us about that. Like, how is it, what's happened or how has it influenced you outside of just what you're doing on the channel itself? Sure. So under developer advocacy, it's more than just .NET and it's more than just JavaScript, right? Like there's a whole ecosystem of languages and tooling and libraries and SDKs and those types of things. You know, we were talking about it yesterday, right? Like the Python SDK for Visual Studio is like tens of millions of downloads. <laughs> it's easily one of the most popular one that's there. So now, like knowing Python a little bit better, I could go in and look at some of these features and understand like why would these features be beneficial and why would you care about them? Right, or maybe even give feedback to the team. Like, yeah, technically this works, but it's not like the way the community would first guess, right? Yeah, totally. Definitely can be able to do things like that. And now even, again, at day one, right, <laughs> four months later, like I'm thinking about, well, what does it feel like to publish a Python web application? Yeah. So I have a background in, in web development and web APIs from a .NET perspective. You know what I mean? Again, like Brian knows about Express and Node and JavaScript things. Now I'm kind of curious, what does it look like to take that existing knowledge and apply it to Python, right? How much is it the same? How much is it totally different? How much is it the yeah. same? What does it feel to actually like publish something and build a web API and build like a web front end and add JavaScript to it and CSS? And, like what does that publishing tool chain look like? Yeah. And then how does it feel like for us publishing it to Azure? Because again, we work in Azure and Azure pays the bills, right? right. So we got we to talk about that a little bit. Brian, how about you? How's it? Affected your role here? Very much the same what Cecil was saying. We're, we're seeing opportunities where we can help contribute in those respects to Python outside of the, the ones that we kind of got hired on for. But in addition to that, like case in point in Microsoft Ignite here, I just gave my first talk that involved Python ever. Okay. At Ignite of all places, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's been really fun and exciting and it's kind of nice to... Uh, just add that to the developer tool belt, my skill set there, right? Yeah, I'm sure it lets you connect with that whole area of the industry that maybe just being a pure JavaScript developer didn't really, you know, you couldn't relate to as well. For sure. What's your plans for topics? Have you guys decided? I know you got four, four more months of Nina's course, but uh, do you actually have any idea what you're doing next? No, I have no idea. Yeah? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, well, so with my other streams, I, ha I probably, the Python stream series that we have, it's probably the one that we have or the one I have that's most planned out, honestly. <laughs> the other ones, I just kind of like, I have a general direction and I just kind of go with it. With ours, we're going to finish going through Nina's, looking at Cecil to make sure we're on the same page. I think we are. Yeah, you're going to decide on the spot right here. <laughs> we're, we're gonna, <laughs> everybody's going to hear it in the podcast now for the first time, exclusive. So we're going to finish up the course and I think we're going to start building out like little tools and fun ways to like integrate that, like getting to the point like Cecil was saying, where we're going to, publish something in production and run it that would be maybe even interact with the chat room and through the twitch stream and that kind of thing right right maybe some sort of api out there on on flask or something that then like drives who knows people could talk to you and something happens yeah, yeah and the, the other thing i'm actually been itching i've been itching to get into doing is uh, a little bit of iot which is what i spoke about here at ignite sure yeah yeah okay in particular like a lot of times my office at home running all this stuff this hardware to do the stream it gets hot in there and i have to ma you know this is a lazy moment here, right? But I have to get up <laughs> and I have to turn my fan on to cool the room off so that I, but like that's me stepping away from the show so I can go do that. So I'd love to have I, the IoT device listen for the temperature and with Python, you know, maybe yeah. trigger the fan to go on on its own kind of thing. But we'll see where we go with it. It does sound a little bit lazy, but I also find like when <laughs> I, but I also find like when I'm recording a show or I'm doing something where I'm like programming, deeply engaged. You don't feel like it's a little hot. Like you get like knocked out of your, your flow. You're like, dang, it is hot in here. How is it so hot? What, you know, and then, then you're like, got to get up and it like breaks your thought, right? Like in your live streaming, I, I think uh, you don't want to do that, right? Exactly. You're getting all sweaty. You got the headphones on covering your ears. You know, it's three hours later, right? Dang, I'm tired. Well, it was 95 degrees in here. <laughs> what was I doing? And you guys are both in Florida where that's a legitimately common thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the interaction with the audience. So maybe Cecil, uh, go to you first on this one. What I've seen when people come in, they'll like send you feedback or say, I have a question about this. Or what if you, it's cool that you wrote the code this way, but what would happen if we, you made this tweak to it, right? Have you, or do you have any plans of having like deeper requirements for participation? Like, hey, everybody, like 
what I want you to do is write this program and then we're going to come discuss it. Or I want you to read this, this article and then we're going to dive into it or like anything like where people need to come more prepared or is it all just like drop in and like take it in? I think we've loosely spoken about it. So again, like if you look at Nina's course, there is a practice section. Okay. So again, so it's, it's two days and each day, at least the first day was split up into eight separate modules. And at the end of the module is a practice section, which kind of is, you know, just exercises and muscle memory exercises that you could do to, you know, remember what we just did. And we don't usually do that one on stream. That's usually like an exercise that we leave for the folks that are looking at the YouTube video mm -hmm. or the live stream to kind of do it yourself. Like we encourage, hey, well, you know, we didn't do this little piece of it, but please you go ahead and for your own practice and, you know, just understanding, like go ahead and play around with it. But I can imagine, like, going forward in the future, we can have more ways for people to, to interact with things. I don't know if it's with the zen of the show, right? Like, if you have too much of a requirement, it might, the people who would just drop in might turn them off, right? But we don't want to do it in a way that it makes you feel left out. Yeah. Like, if you come in in week 20, and this is your first time being on the show, right, you should still feel very welcome and included in whatever it is that we're talking about. You know, the subject matter may or may, may or may not be a little bit over your head, depending on, like, what your experience level is. But you should still feel welcome to, like, sit in the room, right? And we're all at the table and we're all learning together. We spoke a little bit about having, like, a submission form for, like, for, like questions. Not qu for, for questions and for also topics. Yeah. When this thing is done, like, what are some of the things that you want to learn about? And maybe we could do, like, a voting thing. Right. You could let them vote on it and see what one gets voted up or something like that. Yeah, like, do, like, a voting thing. But I think anything that we do in terms of interactivity would be very subtle. It won't be like, you have to do this else you can't sit in this chat room kind of thing. It's not going to be like... Yeah, it won't make any sense unless you've deployed your app yet. Yeah, it's not going to be that serious. But, you know, hopefully it'll be something fun and interesting. And, you know, maybe we'll turn on some more lights in Brian's office. Uh, you know, turn on his fan and stuff like that. You know, we'll see what happens. The IoT thing is fun. It's definitely got a good Python angle, right? You could do MicroPython or CircuitPython. Are you thinking of getting something from like Adafruit or something like that, Brian? Well, it's so funny you say that because that's what the talk was about. It was the CircuitPython Express by Adafruit. Nice. Yeah, that's such a cool little device, right? Like it's 25 bucks and it's got quite a bit of smarts on it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm so blown away by it. Like all everything that's built into that little device what, that you can do. And it's just so fun. It's great with the same sense that we're talking about before. Beginner friendly type stuff. If you're looking to get introduced to programming, introduced to electronics, that thing is a great way to go about doing it and introducing yourself or students, that kind of thing into the whole atmosphere. Yeah, I feel like the programming for that stuff is not too intense often as well. It's not like, well, we've got these 10 files and we, here's where the CSS is and here's the database migrations. And, right? It's like usually there's like the code.py or main.py and yep. you kind of just put it there and it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, they did a fantastic job of making that device, like removing the friction, right? Of setting up all the yeah. things. All you do is change the code.py file and you're good to go. It'll recognize that you made changes and load it all up and get things running. It's really interesting. You know, it came from the BBC micro bit. I, the, the whole idea of the MicroPython stuff, I think. Certainly that's where it first was, was used a lot. And there were a bunch of really interesting studies around exposing kids to that. Like, I think every seventh grader in the UK or something got one for one year. Oh, nice. And they did a bunch of studies. And girls were way more likely to say, like, coding is something that I would consider as a profession compared to you know, before or after, uh, before, you know, other groups who didn't do that or, or whatever. And it's, it just seems like that little hands-on bit has such a powerful effect, especially for, for kids who, you know, don't want to wait for like a website to be built, like really a long ways. I think that's fantastic. And anything that can help make it more welcoming and encouraging for people to, you know, of all kinds of backgrounds and experiences to join in on it is a fantastic thing. Yeah. I actually even experienced it with my own daughter. As I was preparing the talk, I was, I was you know, tinkering with the device, getting acquainted with it. And so we have it set up to where if you shake it, it will turn the lights on or off. And she's only two years old, but she's still like, wow, look at these lights, you know, like it's going on and off. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And I'm glad I have it now because it'll be a great way to like give her the opportunity to explore that area out and if she's interested in it. That's super cool. Cecil, do you do anything with your son? How old is he now? Cameron's seven. Yeah. We haven't done anything in terms of like getting him on the keyboard to like type stuff or, or anything like that. It's a little bit early because like the working with the words and the letters probably that age is still right. just a little challenging but like it's soon right what i have done so like there's this little robot set that he got and robots as in like they're cardboard robots okay but essentially what it does is that one it, it kind of gets you in the habit of like putting pieces together then the robot becomes functional right so like there's a le there's a lever and uh -huh. it, the arms raise and the head tilts and it does like stuff like that uh -huh. and then there's this one other i guess 
I don't know if it's really coding or not, but um, it's like a programming tool where you have like this little robot, like a real robot, like a little plastic thing with wheels on it. And there is a input device that has three buttons on it, right? There's right, left, and there's forward. And you could, depending on the combination that you put in, you could use it to, like, it'll detect the wall, like there's a sensor in front of it. You can tell it what to do when it sees a wall, right? So you put in the input by, by that little device, and then you could have it, like, go through, like, an obstacle, obstacle course. I see. I'm trying to remember what the device is called. I honestly don't remember. Yeah, but, yeah. Like, but the sequence is, like, it's one of the mini then, toys in then his room. right, and then left, and then right. Then right, and so you right. can like hit that key combination, yeah, or something like that, yeah. Right, right. So you you know you put some blocks and whatever cases on the floor, and you put in a key combination. But at, you know at some point, like you could hit the wall of the room. Like, what does it do when it sees the wall? Right. So like he's done things where he just he has it turn up the opposite way around, and like does the obstacle course in reverse, or you know have it go out in the hallway, or you know just have it do different things. And then it also has like a. Um, like a backhoe thing, like a, like a scoop in front of it. So now you can have it like pick things up and move around and like put it somewhere else. Go get your Lego and carry it around or something. It's kind of programming, kind of not. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like programming without the words. The, the There's no computer programming. Involved. Right, it's, and that's what I kind of want to do. I want to get in the mental mind, the mindset of problem solving and not necessarily like being in front of the screen. Because no, this is something that we could do in the backyard or on the porch or yeah. in the living room. Like you don't have to be on a screen, on a tablet or on a smart device to kind of do it. That's cool. Yeah, my daughter who's 11 and in sixth grade, she was really into codecombat.com where you go and you go into the dungeon and you solve the problem. You actually type Python, but it's like the autocomplete is so incredible. Like you can say hero.attack enemy and you type A and it auto-completes that whole line. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, uh, yeah, it's, so there's a bunch of cool opportunities around that. So maybe, Brian, let's talk a little bit about your setup. I know you said people can get started just like with whatever, but I was kind of wondering because when I go and watch you, you're sort of just a disembodied person <laughs> stuck in the corner, right? You've got like a cool green screen and, and some mics and you've got like a bunch of stuff that will rain down, like you can like do all these little sounds and you talked about the light. So maybe give people a sense of like where you could go with like hardware and setup and stuff. I originally was streaming from my MacBook Pro, like a tw the 2016 yeah. kind of model. And I found that it can work on there just fine, streaming from there. But, you know, the fans start spinning up and like that's all you hear, right? And you could tell it's just really cranking out as hard as it can to support all this, right? Sure, okay. And so then I, of course, being the technologist enthusiast, <laughs> that I am. Maybe something with two G-forces in there would be better. <laughs> yeah, so I, I built out a custom PC that I could use for gaming and for this. So it was kind of like twofold there. And that thing is more powerful to handle streaming. So like, obviously the better the hardware that can do a lot of the video encoding and uploading and having a good internet connection through your internet service provider is key. What's the, the resolution you stream at? I stream at 1920 by 1080. That's pretty high. Fairly high. There, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the range that you kind of want to be at. Well, mostly for gaming, because I was doing some game streaming. Uh -huh. So you could go down to 720p if you wanted to, and, the, and people won't mind that, especially for programming. Yeah, sometimes it helps to have the smaller resolution so you can actually read like the menu items and stuff a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's always a trade-off, right? Right. All right, so uh, you got this pretty awesome PC that you built out. Yep. And then uh, I have a combination of cameras, cameras that I had are really work-related that I, I'm using for that that we do and shoot other videos with. Are these like uh, fancy webcams or DSLRs or? I started out with just the, like the Logitech C920, which is like the standard go-to one that like every streamer pretty much is using. Yeah, okay. It's relatively uh, priced well. And I think they have a newer model now, so you could probably even get that one, the 920, at a cheaper price than what it used to be. But then the, the big one that I use, that I don't take advantage of the full capabilities of it because I'm a little bit limited with some of the hardware that I have that interfaces with that. But I have a Canon XC15, which can do 4K at 60 frames per second. Okay, that's pretty awesome. But I'm only really getting the 1080p at like 30 frames per second. Because right, but that's just for your body, which is like a small little thing in the corner. So, right, it's, it's probably fine, right? That's why I'm not worried about it. Like, I could upgrade to another device that captures that video at the higher resolution and, and frame rate. Maybe if you were streaming, like, just you and not you plus screen. Absolutely, yeah. So, yes, and then I use the green screen to help because the, the big thing, like you were talking about before, you want to be able to see a lot what's going on. And so I, I grabbed the green screen to help remove some of my background so that people could see what's behind me. If, the, if you know, something's going on there, notifications or whatever, 
that'd be available. What mic do you use? What microphone? Yeah. Uh, Rody Podcaster. That's a pretty good one. That's one. That's one of the ones I've tried. I don't know. That's how you pronounce it, right? For sure. I've definitely tried that, but it's not necessarily the best. But then I have software that helps clean up a lot of my my audio. I'm using Voice Meter, Potato, and uh, a Cantabile to help re- do some pre. I don't even know the technical terms. I'm just winging it, honestly, with this stuff, man. Yeah. But it's doing a lot of noise filtering pre before it even gets into voice meter and then into my streaming software, which is all, for, this is all, well, voice meter you could pay for. It's like for Nagware, right? They, they, will, they will ask you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then there's a free version of Cantabile. The main streaming software you're going to be using if you want to get started is called Open Broadcasting Software or OBS, OBS. Okay. That thing can be very intimidating, but once you get, there's tons of YouTube videos out there that'll help you get acquainted with it. And once you get the kind of gist of it, you'll you'll really be able to come up with some cool stuff like you've seen on the on the stream there. Yeah, yeah, the stream is super cool. I, I think you're doing a really nice job. So thanks. Yeah, I mean, I guess give us if somebody want to do that. What's the price tag? Is it expensive? Like how much of this stuff costs money? Obviously, the Rode Podcaster is like two three hundred dollars. Like I was saying before, I would start simple. <laughs> Use whatever you can, and then slowly iterate on there and um and add to it, right? But yeah, I don't even know honestly what I'm up to because I've been. It's like. Every couple of months, maybe not even. I, I haven't even done a recent hardware or update. I've just been happy with the setup now that I'm at. But I would say, like every couple of months or so, I'd like look to see. All right, let me see if I can upgrade the microphone or I can upgrade this aspect of it. That's what my advice would be around that. Okay, cool. And Cecil, you're pretty, pretty much just using like your podcast stuff and whatnot. I definitely had some podcasting material. <laughs> um, equipment from before. Yeah. So um, I have a Scarlet box, very similar to the, the Scarlet box you have right now. You know, and I have just have a, like an XLR microphone, and that's really about it, right? Like I have some software on my computer that I used to use for like audio filtering and those types of things, but um, that's really about it. The stream is not coming off of my machine, so essentially what happens? Brian and I are, are not in the same location when we're streaming, so I will call him via like, via some video conferencing software, and he'll just like like Zoom or Skype or something like that. Zoom or Skype or okay. whatever the case is, and then he'll like just put me in into like a frame. Like on the screen. And you can do that with this open broadcast software? That is fancy. That's awesome. Yeah. OBS is pretty cool. Yeah. So you can have different screens and different setups. So now we can have one where both of us, both of our faces are on the screen. Or I think he has another scene where I could share my desktop. Right? And so now my desktop is like in full view. Right. And we just have like little floating heads in the corner. Right, right, right. And so, and so that helps too. Right. So now we could both be on screen, but then now you have a full view of the code and the editor and my desktop and whatever else is we're talking about. Yeah, it looks like Brian's really got it dialed in. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm lucky. I just piggyback off of whatever he's doing. <laughs> like, I just show up and talk. And like he, Brian does all of the hard work. We patch in the, the sound effects and everything that people can play so that he can hear when, peop- what, when things happen. It's kind of hard being on a video call if you're not, you don't want to have the stream up on your machine and the volume loud so it comes through your microphone. So I patch all the audio into the video call with him so that he can hear it. And it's all through that voice meter potato software. It's super helpful. Your own little broadcasting booth. It sounds like it. It's a ton of fun, man. It's open. What's the name of the software again? Open broadcasting software. It's up on GitHub. You get it for free. It's open source. It's cool. That's awesome. All right, guys. Well, I think we're getting pretty short on our time and this booth is going to uh, run out. So really quickly, one question each to close out the show. When you're writing some, uh, some code... What editor do you use? Visual Studio Code. All right, Cecil? This is not even fair. <laughs> I also use Visual Studio Code. All right, right on. No, not a big surprise, is it? Especially with some of the announcements uh, today. That's cool. All right, guys. Thanks so much for being on the show and sharing your uh, look inside the, the Twitch stream and all that. It's been fun. Yeah, awesome. And I definitely love for folks to check it out. And you know, we'll have the links and stuff like that inside of the, the show notes. So yeah, hopefully absolutely. you could see us every Wednesday at 11 o'clock at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time on Twitch. All right, awesome. Thanks. Bye. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Our guests on this episode were Cecil Phillip and Brian Clark, and it's been brought to you by Linode and the University of San Francisco. Start your next Python project on Linode's state-of-the-art cloud service. Just visit talkpython.fm slash Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E. You'll automatically get a $20 credit when you create a new account. Learn how to use Python to analyze the digital economy in the Masters of Applied Economics at the University of San Francisco. Just go to talkpython.fm slash USF to find out more. Want to level up your Python? If you're just getting started, try my Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps course. Or if you're looking for something more advanced, check out our new async course that digs into all the different types of async programming you can do in Python. And of course, if you're interested in more than one of these, be sure to check out our Everything Bundle. It's like a subscription that never expires.
Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes, the Google Play feed at slash play, and the direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Now get out there and write some Python code.